Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. Today we'll be talking about something controversial and very important. We'll be talking about guns. However you come down on it, you likely have an opinion. We'll be talking about guns and mass shooting. Our guest today is John Donahue, Stanford Law professor and a man who has spent a lot of time thinking about guns. John, welcome to Talks on Law. Good to be with you. And I guess before we jump into the, the topic, you recently had a piece in the New York Times advocating for some gun laws. Have you felt a little threatened? Uh, certainly attacked, uh, but just in the written commentary, and that's fine. <laughs> just criticism. Okay, I'm sure you can, you can handle that. But today, uh, we had you come and, and talk a couple of years ago about gun laws, smart laws, and laws that are less, <laughs> less effective. I'd love to talk to you about what laws are actually working, what laws could be put in place to work, and maybe some that don't. Mm-hmm. Before, let's jump in. Let's set the scene. We have more mass shootings in the United States than most countries in our peer group. Maybe you can give a little data. Yeah. So so essentially, uh, the U.S. has an array of gun issues, uh, and we, we do have more overall gun homicides by quite a margin over any other affluent nation. Uh, luckily, that problem has been trending down. Less, uh, less crime. Less crime, uh, because basically there are, there are forces that are always working either to enhance or decrease crime, and many positive things are dampening overall crime levels. That could but, be related to what? Drugs, to social safety net, to uh, Yeah, basically, poverty. Uh, the, the more effective government is, that can bring things down. So affluence uh, obviously helps various types of interventions better schooling and, and initiatives along that, those lines. If we can deal with drug problems, that can bring down crime. And also policing has become more effective over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the technologies of uh, uh, you know, camera supervision and things of that nature. So those are all depressing crime. Uh, our gun uh, infatuation probably is enhancing crime, but for overall homicides, uh, the depressing factors are overwhelming the enhancing factors. So crime is sort of trending down. So yeah, you would think if crime overall is trending down, then so would gun violence. Yeah. Yeah. And and the, the area where we're seeing it move the other direction is in the mass shootings. How do you define, I mean, people talk about mass shootings in a couple different ways. Is a mass shooting, is there a number of people that have to be involved? Is there a number of victims that have to be involved? Yeah, there is no single definition. And so different uh, researchers and and government institutions uh, are free to set their own definition. Uh, So, for example, the FBI did a very major study on active shooters, and there they didn't actually quantify number of victims. They just tried to look at cases where someone went into a public venue and and tried to kill people. Um, And if the police are effective in stopping that person quickly, they may not end up killing a lot of people. So maybe even no victims, but it was still a, a mass shooting, or at least attempted. Attempted. Yeah. So, for example, at the Garlic Festival in uh, California in the summer of 2019, the uh, a mass shooter, uh, attempted mass shooter, came in with an AK-47, and he... Uh, an actual AK-47. So this wasn't assault style. This was a straight-up military weapon. Well, it's they're, they're all... Uh, definitional. What is considered uh, assault style or, or military is, is somewhat definitional. But in any event, uh, he came in bent on mass murder, but was killed after he had uh, killed three people. So mm. under some definitions, that doesn't get included as a mass shooting event, because some of the definitions say you have to kill four people before it it's considered a mass shooting event. That was clearly an active shooter incident that the FBI considers. And in some of my work, I I set the threshold a little bit higher to really identify, um, you know, the worst mass shooting events at at six or more killed. Uh, So so different. different But you could certainly imagine in that case, had the law enforcement been a little less effective, uh, the outcome could be way uh, more tragic. Yeah, we, we've been lucky in, in some recent mass shootings where the police were right on the spot. So there was a, a, a terrible one also summer of 2019 in Dayton, Ohio, where a guy uh, started shooting at a crowded bar area in Dayton, Ohio, managed to kill nine people, 
but was gunned down by the police in 32 seconds. Wow. Uh, and so had— So there happened to be an officer in the bar, or he, he well, popped he, in? Yeah, he, he started shooting at the crowd just outside the bar, and it turned out there were multiple police around there. And, and actually, this is an unusual event. There were actually more bullets fired at the shooter— then he fired himself. Wow. But he did manage to kill nine and injure 22 people in the That's 32 horrendous. seconds, including his sister, uh, which was uh, one of the victims in the case. Well, I mean, and maybe it's important for us to take a second and step back from the data and realize that, you know, this is about so much destruction and tragedy. When you're, when you're, when you're talking about a mass shooting, it's easy to get caught up. Okay, Las Vegas had had X number, and that was the most, and Orlando had this number. But um, each one of these victims, even even one victim, is clearly too many. Um, you know, lives and their families' lives are, are irreparably changed. Yeah, and and of course, this is having a very big impact on the public psyche because every parent now has it in their mind. You know, when my kid goes to the mall or the music concert or even to school there is a risk of a, of a mass shooting in the U.S. in a way that most other affluent nations don't fear that particular risk. And I mean, I'm a couple of years younger than you, and we never had active shooter drills when, when I was, um, you know, even in law school. We're taping today um, courtesy of Columbia Law School, um, and I understand that Columbia Law School has actor, active shooter drills to keep, you know, their student body uh, as well informed as possible. Yeah, it's it's a fairly widespread uh, concern among academic institutions. Uh, uh, I took my daughter to see uh, the play Hamilton at uh, San Francisco Theater uh, a few months back, and uh, uh, a person collapsed in the aisle uh, from a medical emergency, and someone shouted out, "There's a gun!" And there was a wild stampede out of the uh, oh, theater. Oh, wow. That's and, scary. And uh, Yeah. And, That's and, literally the uh, fire in a crowded theater uh, exactly. <laughs> example. So, so there was no gun, but uh, uh, there was a rampage out. People died in the, in the attempt to get out of the building. So it was a, quite, a, quite a horrific scene. That's something that pretty much only happens in the United States among affluent nations right now. So, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the damage or the cost... Is, is so much higher than the actual victims. It's, it's how we as a society have to live in a certain amount of fear or have to invest or feel we have to invest in these radical steps to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe. Yeah, yeah. so th- that, that is the reason that mass shootings are um, having quite an impact in the current policy discourse and, and it's energizing a lot of student activism and and other initiatives to rethink uh, gun policy in a number of respects. I guess um, we can't have this conversation without going to, you know, to the Constitution, taking it back to the Second Amendment. We, as a nation, have what seems like a love affair with with guns. Maybe it's maybe it's Hollywood driven. Maybe Mm -hmm. it's it's just really effective NRA publicity. But the Second Amendment is pretty, uh, pretty early on in our Bill of Rights. what, you know, how was that interpreted historically in the United States? Yeah, so of course the, the amendment became effective in 1791 at a time when the nature of the weaponry was far different from what we experienced. Is that like flint musket or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you, if you look at the weaponry available in 1791, none of it could possibly lead to a mass shooting event. It took like 30 seconds to reload a musket. Uh, that would give plenty of time for... To run out of the range of that musket. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and the weaponry today, of course, as we mentioned with the Dayton shooter, is so potent that you can you can shoot 30 people in, in a matter of seconds. Um, and so it is a different sort of problem. And, and that... That's something that probably a lot of people don't know. We're talking about 30 people in a matter of seconds, not even minutes. These guns are incredibly powerful. They're sophisticated, and they're made for for imposing harm, for yeah. imposing danger. Yeah, so for example, the AR-15, which is uh, a sort of a weapon of choice of some of the mass shooters, was actually designed uh, for combat use in Vietnam. 
And if you look at the Department of Defense descriptions of how effective it was a, a, as a killing machine, it really is quite astonishing chilling. Uh, to think what happens when a mass shooter gets uh, his hands on such a weapon and uses it on a crowd of people, which is what a number of these mass shooters try to do. They get to, uh, of course, the Las Vegas killing up in a hotel, down, shooting down on people at a concert. Uh, it, it's a frightening thought. From a long distance away. Yeah, yeah, from a long distance away. So the capacity to stop that individual was limited uh, and his capacity to rain down terror was was great. And in fact, even there, we were lucky. He, he did manage to shoot almost 500 people. Uh, but uh, if the police hadn't gotten in and stopped him, uh, it, it could have even been worse. And even there, did, am I mistaken or did he, he take his own life? Yeah, he, he ended up uh, killing himself as the police uh, were, were trying to break down the door into his uh, apartment uh, hotel room. Okay, so the Constitution may not have been able to anticipate um, advances in weapons technology, uh, but but it's pretty clear that the the Constitution did anticipate a right for self defense, a right of the people to bear arms. Yeah. So the the interesting question is. Um, uh, the Constitution actually says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And so for a long time there was a debate, does this Second Amendment confer a right for a state to have a militia hmm. or is it a more personal right of self-defense and the right to have a gun for other lawful purposes? And for a couple of hundred years, the Supreme Court never explicitly addressed that issue. Uh, but in 2008, in the Heller opinion, the Supreme Court said it was a personal right and a right to uh, self-defense within the home. And now the Supreme Court has uh, taken an, a new case that might say it, it has a broader right beyond self-defense in the home to the right to carry in public. And so we're waiting to see what the next decision of the Supreme Court will be. It's sort of astounding. I mean, it's it's probably surprising to many of us, particularly those who have not, you know, been entrenched in Second Amendment scholarship, how little was written on the Second Amendment or how little was, was determined judicially on the Second Amendment uh, for so long. You mentioned 2008. Yeah. And all, all those centuries of U.S. history, we didn't have a major opinion yeah. uh, establishing or, or clarifying this right. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly, it just wasn't brought to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was not thought to be a, a major issue for a few centuries. If it had ever come to the court before 2000, the right would be much more limited than it now is. It, it got to the court when the NRA pushed it ahead at a time when they had five votes uh, so they managed to get a 5-4 decision that created this initial right. And now with the two recent Trump appointees, uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, they feel that they're in a particularly strong position. And the NRA aspiration is to strike down all the limits on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines and have them declared as unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. Well, I guess... Why don't we take a step back and we maybe discuss what role the government should be playing when it comes to guns? I mean, some people may have a little bit more libertarian attitude and say, well, if 99.9% .9 of gun owners are responsible gun owners, why make policy around that small fraction of a percent? Yeah. You know, it's, it, it is one of the great problems for government more broadly. Um, when do you intervene uh, because a relatively small fraction of individuals uh, misbehave in, in some way? And, and Have you ever shot a gun? Uh, not a lot, but, you know, when I was younger, I did skeet shooting and things of, it's fun. of that nature. Yeah, shooting guns is, is fun. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that is really one of the big trade-offs. So, for example, a lot of people like shooting off AR-15s. Uh, and they feel it's a fun thing that they can do with their family. And, of course, most of the time things go very well. Um, 
And in any given year, only three one thousandths of one percent of the American public ends up killing someone with a gun. So three it, one thousandths. Yeah. So it's a small percentage. But um, I think uh, I looked more people are dying in plane crashes than well, then on maybe, the other end of a of, of a gun. Yeah, well, it, it it probably depends a little bit on on the nature of the. Uh, Scrap what I said. I think it's mass shootings. Yeah. Victims of mass shootings are less than, yeah. than, than than plane crashes, but you know, homicides in general would be a lot larger. Yeah. So so homicides are are a big part of the problem, and gun suicides are a growing part of the problem. You know, the the one demographic that is. Uh, Interesting is that older white men are are really going in for guns in a big way, and their their rates of death are, for the first time in history, rising sharply. You know, the the history of America. You think is, older white men, men in a position of privilege, and here, um, they're really being punished. Yeah. So so suicide rates are rising very sharply in in that group. Gun suicide rates. Uh, so it is one of the. Is it older men? What about younger men? Uh, well, y- younger men as well. All, uh, v- virtually all white men uh, are experiencing upticks in, in suicide. Hmm. Uh, and, and that is a troubling phenomenon. Uh, but it's really rising sharply uh, among older white men. And by that, I mean, you know, 55 and older. Have you looked into what numbers relate to guns? Uh, yeah, a, a very big component of this increase in the older white male population are gun suicides. And, and so essentially, uh, the guns everywhere movement that has a certain currency in, in certain circles does put people at risk because uh, one problem with suicide is momentary senses of despair that can be quickly effectuated into a suicidal act are, are facilitated by easy access to guns. That's a good point. I mean, many of us may uh, experience a, a moment of feeling helpless or even uh, worthless, but hopefully that's quick, and hopefully that doesn't result in in violence. Yeah, and, and one of the advantages of other mechanisms of suicide is that they're much less effective, so a lot of people survive you know, taking Taking pills pills and things of that nature and then go on to have happy lives. Uh, But if you try to kill yourself with a gun, you usually are successful. Or at least you're doing some some serious damage in the process. Exactly. Well, we talked about homicides. We talked about suicides. Maybe we should touch on gun accidents as well, because, you know, that's an, an argument that some who advocate for regulation point to. People are accidentally shooting their kids, accidentally shooting their, their family, right. accidentally, you know, hearing a noise in the night. Yeah, and just this this past weekend, so September 2019 uh, in Texas, I think five children were shot in in, uh, in the state of Texas. And uh, freak- Wait, five children were shot just in one weekend? Yeah, just in one weekend. All related or not related? No, all, all unrelated events. Uh, but typically of the pattern where, you know, a young child will get a, a gun and either accidentally or playing around kill one of their siblings. Uh, and, and this has become a significant problem. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, recently, again, in Texas, a, uh, a mother was taking her four-year-old son to a Little League baseball game. She ran into the house to get something and left the kids in the car. Uh, the four-year-old saw that there was a gun in the console, took the gun out, and killed his six-year-old sister with the gun. Uh, Intentionally? uh, You know, unclear whether he just was playing around with the gun and and shot her. Uh, But, you know, kids of that age aren't even aware, really, of of the magnitude of the danger. Yeah. Yeah. So so access to guns by kids is almost always a, a bad idea. And if you have guns everywhere they are going to get access to them in a certain, you know, obviously limited number of cases. But uh, the, the What are the numbers uh, around accidental shootings? Yeah, well, so I, the, the highest number for gun uh, adverse consequences is suicide. So you're getting about 22,000 gun suicides a year. You're probably getting that's about— That's huge. Yeah, so that's, that's the biggest number. You're probably getting a little more than half that for gun homicides— and then gun accidents are a little bit 
um, harder to clarify, but much lower number, maybe a thousand gun uh, accident deaths. The reason why I say it's unclear is that for some of these cases where the four-year-old son shoots the eight-year-old daughter or something, they, they call it They may it not a, report it somehow. Or they call it a homicide, and, and other people call that an accident. So it depends on the way the police report it. The NRA likes to call those homicides because gun accidents are the one thing that they unambiguously know look very bad. <laughs> uh, homicides, they can say, well, this so was a criminal. So it's better marketing. Yeah, better marketing to turn those into homicides as opposed to accidents. Okay, so I guess this is a long way to say there's a lot of damage, there's a lot of people's lives being lost. At some point, the government will have to make a decision. Is, is it worth taking away someone's ability to buy something that they want, something that they might enjoy, if it has a net benefit to the society at large. Yep. And you know, what's you know, what's your general thought? Well, again, it's like everything. Uh, when one makes decisions about government policy, there are almost always trade-offs. There are going to be some benefits and some costs. Uh, from my own view, looking at the damage that mass shootings are doing in the United States and my apprehension that this problem is getting worse at a very sharp rate, um, I, I think we really should step in and take some greater measures to address the mass shooting problem. Is this like speeding? Is it, is it like, you know, I like driving, I like driving fast. Sometimes I might want to drive very fast, but there are rules in place. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and uh, we have a, a very elaborate regulatory process to deal with the not trivial dangers of car accidents. And I think we should probably start putting in place a, a greater uh, regulatory regime to deal with the, uh, the growing problem of mass shootings. So I think today when we talk about the laws, we should think about them in two different ways. One, we touched a little bit on the constitutional issue, and you've kind of hinted at the idea that there may be even additional constitutional protections for gun ownership or for gun sellers um, coming down the road. We can talk about that, and I'd also still like to talk about what makes for good slash smart mm -hmm. uh, regulation. Because we, when we think about uh, regulating guns today, I'd like to focus on what would help, what would actually make a difference. Yeah. Yeah, so we are at a interesting crossroads in the U.S. where the public is getting very alarmed and energized by the growing mass shooting problem. So they're pushing for greater regula re regulation at the same time that the NRA is hoping that the Supreme Court will slam the door and say there no can regulation. be no regulation. In fact, uh, I was an expert witness in a case in California where a federal judge just struck down all the limits on high capacity magazines, uh, which I think was a very ill-advised decision. High capacity magazines in a case in California, what was the name of the case? Um, the case is called Duncan versus Becerra, Becerra being the attorney general of the state of California. And it was a challenge to uh, an expansion of California's pre-existing ban on high capacity magazines. So California wanted to limit the amount of bullets guns can hold or the magazines can hold. Yeah, so, so essentially uh, at one point there was a federal assault weapon ban in the United States that limited the size of the magazine to 10 rounds. And so California accepted that limitation and then wanted to go further to say, well in the past we said no new magazines, but you can keep the ones that you had to say uh, we want to get rid of them all completely so that it's unlawful to possess any pre-existing magazines. And the NRA sued when this new referendum was passed by the citizens of the state of California by a two-to-one measure. And um, a federal judge not only struck down the new law, but said there can be no limit on the size of the magazine. So this was a big win for the NRA. Yeah, very big big win for the NRA. Uh, I suspect that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will overturn that, and then the Supreme Court will make the ultimate decision. And it will probably be a 5-4 decision, as the Heller decision was as well. So either eliminating the ability of California and other states to impose limits, 
uh, or uh, saying that the limits are acceptable. You got to think that at some point, uh, the extremity of of the power of technology has to has to kick in. I mean, maybe you can own a gun, but can you own a tank? Can you own a and you know a, a rocket launcher? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I do think that uh, this is one thing that the uh, NRA crowd often is not very clear about. Uh, it, it's absolutely essential that there has to be some limit uh, because the, the, the amendment says the right to keep and bear arms uh, certainly can't be thought to include nuclear arms. And, and uh, the, the power and speed of shooting of the weaponry is growing at such a rapid rate that uh, limits have to be imposed. And, and I think uh, uh, the very sharp rise in mass shootings that we've seen over the last five years and essentially since the end of the federal assault weapon ban in 2004 uh, are going to impress upon the public that there's a need for this. Mm -hmm. The only question is, will it come before or after the Supreme Court decides whether the Constitution bars any of these measures? It's an interesting area of the law because you see an alignment right now with some on the left who are advocating for more gun regulation and law enforcement, which doesn't, it doesn't necessarily tend to go uh, Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that police have to fear in, in, in the United States, uh, besides getting into car accidents, is getting shot. And it really has impacted the nature of policing in the United States in a way that most other affluent nations don't have the same concern. And so you see this in many and it, different it, it ways. And it may be tied to some of these really awful, horrendous police shootings um, because they're scared. Yeah, no question about it. The, the police in the U.S. have much more to fear from the citizenry. Uh, and as a result, uh, American police kill a lot more people because they have to be quick on the trigger. Uh, they, they don't know when somebody is reaching into, a, into their... And neither of us, for the record, are advocating or <laughs> defending um, really awful uh, police abuse. But it, it, is, it is easy to imagine that fear, especially when you know that these weapons can be so powerful. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, one striking number, I thought, was that... Uh, in the first 24 days of uh, 2015, uh, American police killed more people than had been killed in England in the last 24 years. 24 days versus years. Yeah. So uh, essentially, American police kill people at about 100 times the rate of many European police forces. And it largely is driven by the fear of guns. We talked about this a little bit. You know, there was there's the view that we have a right to guns to protect our homes. And there's also an argument that that travels with us when we leave the homes. Why don't we take a look at gun carrying laws and, and what's out there and, and what's on the horizon? Yeah. So, uh, again, this is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, 30 years ago, states all across the country uh, had pretty substantial restrictions on the ability to carry guns outside the home. You would need to take go to a course or you'd have a need a special need or, or purpose. Yeah, in, in many states it was actually absolutely prohibited. In, in other states there was a, a procedure that you had to go through. you had to establish a need for it. you had to establish that you were a person who was fit to carry. Uh, now, overwhelmingly, the states have moved away to, into a much more libertarian posture, and the NRA is trying to take it one step further to say that uh, it's a constitutional right that the state cannot infringe, that you have the right to carry a gun anywhere you, you want to. And even making the argument that that's perhaps a solution to some of the, the mass shooting problems yeah. is, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, the way to stop a bad shooter is a good shooter. Yeah, and so, for example, I was just an expert witness in a trial uh, a couple of months ago in Missouri where after Missouri passed a law that said anyone 19 years or older can carry a gun anywhere in the state without any permit or government intervention, uh, the University of Missouri insisted that their ban on guns, which has been in place for over 60 years, uh, would prevent people from being guns on, on campus. 
and they were sued, uh, and there was a trial to decide whether the uh, uh, the constitutional rights of uh, Missouri citizens are being uh, infringed, infringed by, by the, not allowing them on campus. Yeah. So what happened? Well, we're waiting for the decision to come down. Uh, it's a very politically controversial issue in, in Missouri. In fact, uh, to give you a sense of how avid Missouri legislators are about gun rights, uh, a Republican legislator in Missouri has offered two amendments, one requiring all citizens over 21 to get an assault weapon. Requiring them? Re requiring, and one to require them to have a concealed carry weapon as well. Um, so well, that that's probably a little bit of a wing nut. I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine that law going anywhere. Yeah, no, that 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 is pushing the extreme. But it it gives you a sense of how fervent the beliefs are on the NRA side. Of oh, you this think issue. you love guns? I love guns. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why don't we take a look at gun carrying laws and and what's out there? And I I thought after the the Parkland shooting, there there had been kind of a a little bit of a move in the other direction. Well, uh, for example, Texas just uh, uh, recently adopted an, uh, a range of mechanisms designed to allow citizens to carry guns more broadly, the argument being the NRA view that uh, if the citizenry is armed, they, they can stop the mass shooters. So is there data? Have you looked at that issue? Is there data to, to show that you know, good shooters can stop? Yeah, the, the the FBI has actually done some very good work on this issue, and and we we do see that as the number of people carrying uh, concealed weapons grows across the country, we're also seeing this massive rise in mass shooting. So so the first cut you get is it's not working as a mechanism to to stop mass shootings, but the second thing to note is that in an FBI. Uh, examination of uh, 160 mass shooting episodes from 2000 to 2013, uh, there was only one case where uh, a, a citizen uh, stopped a uh, active shooter incident, and that was an active duty military person. So someone with a lot of training. Yeah. And, and in general, unless you're armed security or a police officer or active duty military, uh, chances are you're not going to be able to play an effective role in dealing with a mass shooting episode. Or even worse. I mean, my my horror would be, you know, let's say I happen to be carrying a weapon and there's a the, an active shooter and I attempt to stop uh, this horrible situation and shoot someone who's just happened to be a, a bystander. Yeah, no, no question. It's, it's not a a trivial concern in the Thousand Oaks uh, uh, shooting in California, um, a uh, uh, police officer ran into the uh, bar where the active shooter was uh, to try to take him out. He was shot five times by the active shooter and then was killed by another police officer who was shooting at the active shooter, but but shot. Oh, the so even people with training are, are not immune yep. to, to yeah. missing. Yeah, these are these are very chaotic and yeah. dangerous situations. And indeed, uh, almost 45 percent of the time that police engage with the active shooter, uh, they end up getting shot themselves. So it's a but instinctively, if, if you had to be in an in an active shooting situation, a mass shooting situation, would you want to have a gun? No question. If if somebody, you know, jumped into this room and, and you could put a gun in my hand right at that moment, I, it would be great. Uh, the problem is um, these are relatively rare events. So if you were actually going to arm enough people to have a difference, you, you would essentially be requiring millions upon millions of people to be carrying guns all the time. And, and that may cause... And that causes other a whole array of other problems and, and, you know, everything from gun accidents to road rage incidents. Um, so the overall death toll would go up. Uh, but, you know, if if you were lucky enough to uh, have, you know, God send down a gun right at the moment when a mass shooter stepped into your building, uh, that, You'd that, take it. that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit about trends. What if... John Donahue was making policy. You've spent a lot of time thinking about this. 
what laws do you think can actually make an impact on on cutting into some of these uh, senseless deaths? Well, for the mass shooting problem, I think the first thing that uh, is sort of tragic is that we had a federal assault weapon ban in place that both limited uh, certain assault weapons, but very importantly, had a restriction on the size of magazines to 10. This was during the Clinton administration? Yeah, it was, it was adopted in 1994. The NRA was powerful enough at the time to have a 10-year uh, sunset provision on the law. And even though George W. Bush had run uh, in his presidential campaign on the promise to uh, reauthorize the assault weapon ban, he, he, he reneged it, on that. He let it go. Uh, and so it lapsed in 2004. That really has triggered the big rise in mass shootings since then. Uh, and so it would be good to get back to where we were. So step one, get us back to 1995? Uh, yeah, that would be good. It's, it's going to be hard to uh, uh, put the genie back in the bottle in a yeah, way. Yeah, how do you get all these millions of guns that have been sold yeah. off the streets? Yeah, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and, and I sort of mourn for the fact that uh, things have gotten a lot worse than they were. We had a good law in place and uh, uh, we, we allowed that to lapse. But at least uh, we're in a hole and we're digging rapidly here, so we should stop digging uh, <laughs> by, by stopping the problem getting any worse going forward. We are going to have to make difficult And there's judgments. always this weird phenomenon that whenever someone, whenever there's a law that's on the horizon, it triggers a mass buying frenzy. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a significant problem. So if I were uh, in policy today, you really do have to decide, are we going to impose an, a new restriction that says no more uh, assault weapons, no more high capacity magazines, or are we going to do what Australia did in the wake of their catastrophic uh, mass shooting of 1996? What did they do? They, within 12 days, decided that they were going to ban all uh, semi-automatic rifles and buy them back. So they have eliminated their mass shooting problem. So they went, they went a step further and said, not only are we no longer selling these, but you know, all of you who have them in your house, all of, the, all of you who have already purchased them, you're going to have to get rid of them. Yeah, that's right. And uh, at the time, it was extremely controversial when they announced that in Australia. Today, almost everyone in Australia thinks uh, it, was, it was the right move to make, and it would be almost impossible to go against the, uh, the current ban. I feel like I remember some of the you know, more conspiracy-minded talk, talk radio people saying how Obama was going to come for, for our guns, and Obama was going to going to do the same thing. Yeah, it was very much uh, part of the NRA selling campaign to make people fear that uh, their guns were going to be taken away uh, because, uh, as you noted, it, it is a great impetus to gun sales. Um, you know, the whole marketing side of guns has been a problematic element in the U.S. Uh, the, the, the years of the Clinton administration were a time of dramatic crime drops and that really undermined gun sales in America. Uh, so the NRA basically had to come up with a new strategy. So gun sales are, are actually shown to be related to, to insecurity, not just yeah. recreation or fun? Yeah, uh, the big driver of gun sales now has been uh, you know, fear about crime. Uh, it, it, when it falls, as it did during the Clinton administration, gun sales really plummet. And uh, if things can be done to increase fear, then, then gun sales will, will rise. And, of course, the incentives for the gun sellers and the NRA are very perverse here because mm. they want to elevate fear and crime sells guns and mass shooting sells guns. That is a really awful. I mean, it seems perverse that a mass shooting where sometimes these are children, you know, horrifically killed. What's the impact at the gun stores, a big boon. Yeah, no question about it. And of course, the NRA tries to feed that idea that, uh, you know, you better get your gun because the mass shooting problem is rising. And if you're uh, out there without a gun, you won't be able to protect yourself and your loved ones. So it, it is a promotional aspect of gun sales in the U.S. While we're talking about promotion, there's an interesting law uh, that I believe the NRA lobbied for 
that limits the ability of gun manufacturers to be held liable for their advertisements or for at all yeah. related to, to, to wrong done by people using their product? Yeah, it was a bill passed in 2005 and probably has played uh, another significant role in the increase in mass shootings because the combination of getting rid of the assault weapon ban and then encouraging the gun industry to be as aggressive as possible in uh, the sales of these military-style weapons uh, has played a role, I think, in the growth of, of mass shootings. I've heard talk about this particular advertisement about asserting your man card or uh, what, what? Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yeah, it was basically the Bushmaster rifle that Adam Lanza used when he killed uh, the 26 uh, individuals at Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School. And uh, the Bushmaster advertisement was uh, consider your man card reissued and they showed the very scary looking uh, assault weapon that, that Bushmaster sells. So buy this sells. product and, and be a real man. Yeah. And so much of the advertising is, uh, you know, this is the closest thing to being in the military. And um, obviously for most people, that's going to be harmless. But if you're a mentally troubled individual uh, feeling enormous uh, uh, sense of powerlessness and weakness and maybe anger at the world for whatever your misfortunes are, that message can be a very dangerous one. And many of our mass shooters fall into exactly that category where they are writing in their diaries, you know, now with the power of the AR-15, you know, I can avenge all of the uh, wrongs that have been done to me. And um, and so we see that in, in shooters like Adam Lanza, the Parkland so do shooter. You think, do you think that uh, some type of restriction on marketing, maybe like with alcohol or with tobacco, where those are restricted in, in advertising t uh, towards children or... Yeah, I mean, I think the the normal tort remedies probably would be enough if if the government, I mean, if the uh, uh, gun industry felt uh, I'm going to look bad in front of a jury when it turns out that my Bushmaster advertisements were influencing mass shooters, uh, putting tort liability there as a potential threat would would inhibit the excesses of advertising. So maybe not in something new, just removing this. Uh, Immunity, immunity statute. Yeah, yeah I, I think it would be a, a great idea to restore the assault weapon ban, remove the immunity statute, and then bring in much more effective uh, universal background checks. Uh, it really is shameful in the United States that in a state like Texas, there can be a, uh, a warrant for your arrest uh, on a charge of murder and you can still go into a gun store in Texas and buy a gun because the NRA has managed to convince uh, uh, the policymakers that until you're convicted, uh, you shouldn't be uh, 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 impeded in your ability to buy a gun. So an arrest warrant in Texas wow, is not enough. Wow, that's extreme. Yeah. And you, and you got to think, you know, hopefully there's not that many warrants for arrest for murder, but domestic violence issues, if there's been... Uh, domestic violence complaints, and then you're going out and buying a gun. Maybe that should be, uh, an, you know, enough of a red flag to, to keep the gun away. Yeah, you know, as I look at the mass shooter incidents, almost every one uh, had more than enough red flags, and that in a European style system, they would have been uh, barred from access to weaponry. Uh, in the U.S., where it's a very, very lenient standard to screen out who has access to guns. Uh, we just let a, a, a lot of people who most people would say, I can't believe a person who has demonstrated this pattern of misconduct in the past has access to weapons. And do they work? I mean, the, the criticism would be, look, if the guy wants a gun, and I say guy because most of these happen to be men, mm -hmm. if the guy wants a gun, he'll get a gun. Maybe he'll ask his friend to buy it for him or he'll mm -hmm. Uh, he'll buy one from a criminal source. Yeah. There's no question that we can't stop the problem, uh, at least given the current configuration of uh, gun ownership in America. But we can, we can slow it down. And so Adam Lanza was a, a kid living in a home 
where he refused to leave his house. So he, he actually wasn't, and he didn't have any friends. Uh, so he wasn't in a posture to get an assault weapon. Uh, but his mother had embodied the NRA message that you need an arsenal to protect yourself and your family. Uh, these were his mother's weapons? These were his mother's weapons. So she was the first person he killed. Uh, so it gives you a sense of the complete detachment from reality mm. of the real risks that uh, she was facing, that she made these weapons available to her deeply troubled son who was burning himself with cigarettes in the year before this episode, wasn't leaving his room. And she probably imagined that she had these to protect him as well as herself. Yeah, she was very adamant about it that uh, she feared, as the NRA encourages people to fear, that the hordes might come to attack uh, and she lived in Newtown, Connecticut, probably one of the safest places in the Western world. Uh, and the only danger was that she made guns available to someone who was very troubled. All right. So background checks, maybe get rid of the immunity. What else? What else do you see out there as potentially viable? Yeah. Well, again, uh, one huge problem we've had is that background checks have been limited in scope in the sense that you could buy a gun through a private sale that didn't have to go through a background These check. These gun shows. Yeah, gun shows are just online. online. Uh, so in states like California now, you have to go through a gun dealer to make a purchase so that we can uh, have a background check. Oh, so even if, so let's say I own four or five guns. I don't want them anymore. I can't just put them up on eBay. Yeah, that's right. It, it's, it's got a, The transfer has to go through a, a licensed gun dealer, mm -hmm. uh, and that would be a, a, a good first step. But I still think we have to go further. We have to take the people like Aaron Alexis. He's a guy who killed, uh, uh, I think it was 12 people at the Washington Navy shipyard a few years ago. And he had at one point shot through the roof of his apartment building because his neighbor up above was making too much noise. Wow. He then went out on the street one day because someone was making too much noise on the street and shot four tires out of a car. And yet he was not entered into any uh, prohibition uh, so that the background check that could have screened him out if that information I had been I hear about in. such minor things, putting people in jail for long periods of time. Here's a guy firing a weapon into his neighbor's home, yeah. and, and very little is done. <laughs> the thought was, uh, you know, just be more careful next time. Uh, but these are the things that should get you put on a prohibited purchaser list. And while the NRA hates to limit gun sales to people, uh, um, you know, we do have to think about issues of public safety. And um, so many of these individuals uh, self-identify as people who should not have access to guns. So I think we really need to... What do you mean by self-identify? Well, by engaging in very inappropriate misconduct. Oh, right. So they're not admitting that their guns... They're not saying, take away my guns, but they're doing... They're, yeah. they're taking active steps that, that yeah. show that. Yeah, so I, I think anybody who's out of anger firing guns at other people uh, or shooting guns in, in a car uh, tire because you're angry at, at noise that somebody is making, they have demonstrated that they should not have access to weapons. And without doing a, uh, a massive national poll, I would guess there's a large population of the country who would feel oh, yeah. in agreement with that. I mean, 90% of Americans and a, an overwhelming number of NRA members support universal background checks, but unfortunately the power of the gun lobby is so strong in Congress that uh, you can't even get a vote on that issue. You mentioned that there are these um, red flags that go off. Mm -hmm. There's some laws that are looking at, at taking away guns from people who show uh, a mental uh, something concerning a, a mental illness or, like you said, perhaps a, pe a penchant for violence. Yeah. Yeah. So so a number of states have uh, moved in the direction of um, red flag laws, as you mentioned, that that uh, allow 
uh, perhaps a, a parent or a family member or the police to say, uh, we're concerned that this person represents a threat to themselves or others, and therefore we should uh, think about taking away their guns. There was a, there was a terrible case in California where a, a very troubled young man uh, was showing signs that he was inclined towards uh, committing uh, acts of violence uh, against women primarily. And uh, his parents told the police, uh, but because he presented rather well, uh, the, the police felt there was nothing they could do. And he wrote in his diary, good thing they, they didn't come in and search my apartment because if they had found my cache of weapons, uh, they, they would have would've, been done for. Yeah, I would have been done. And so he was able to, to engage in shooting at Santa Barbara University. Uh, and, and killed a number of individuals there. So we're moving in the direction, at least in some states, of uh, allowing these. But does that raise due process questions? Is that, is that enough that a family member says, you know, I think he shouldn't have a gun, I think he might be dangerous? Yeah. Well, essentially these laws do f allow for a judicial process uh, within a number of days uh, so the guns will be taken away immediately, but within a couple of days, uh, you, if you feel uh, that would be inappropriate, can present uh, to the judge the reason why your your guns should not be taken away. So there is a due Have, process. Has there been appellate review of this of these type of laws? Yeah, so far the the courts have been uh, uh, sympathetic with the idea. Does that raise due process questions when you're you're taking away a weapon? Yeah, absolutely. Whenever the, the state uh, gets involved with taking something away from a citizen, there is a due process concern. Uh, but there's also a very important public safety consideration here. And I do think most Americans uh, understand that uh, there is an opportunity for a reasonable accommodation of interests here. Um, again, the, the NRA promotes a very exaggerated sense of the need for uh, a gun every second. And the idea that uh, someone whose parents are so concerned about the safety of uh, a loved one that, that they would uh, inappropriately go to the police or the courts, I think is small compared to the, the, the real dangers that those individuals might present to the greater world. Again, to, to make the, the, the analogy to cars, I mean, it's it's intuitive to us that, you know, if I'm speeding or if I'm drunk driving, that the state has the ability to take away my, my driver's license. And as much as Americans love the freedom of the road, um, that's a sacrifice that we're willing to accept. Under this more robust constitutional view of a right to bear arms or a right to guns, could these type of laws be at risk? N yeah, no question. And, and certainly um, there are the sort of libertarian wing of uh, individuals who, who think all of these laws should be prohibited. And certainly uh, we've seen in California, um, you know, some federal judges who are, are very much inclined to go in that direction. So there is a, a very big legal battle that's underway right now. Uh, I'm hoping that the uh, uh, the views uh, championed by one conservative Republican appointee who, who is a federal circuit court of appeals judge who wrote an opinion in uh, one of the assault weapon bans Who's cases. This? His name is J. Harvey Wilkinson. Um, and he said uh, to tell the American people that they are powerless to address the problem of mass shootings and that their fate will be decided by federal judges would be a body blow to democracy. And I'm hoping that the Supreme Court listens to those words. In other words, if, if you take away the ability of states to draw back, to, to take away these weapons, these very dangerous tools, um, you're limiting their ability to stop these types of, of crimes. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting moment for our democracy. As I said, with 90% of Americans wanting universal background checks and then the danger that the Supreme Court or Congress might thwart that ambition, uh, it, it shows there's tensions in American democracy right now. Why don't we take a, a quick journey abroad? Americans, we love guns. We have this, the Second Amendment uh, protecting this gun right. What countries are doing this better? I, I think of you know Scandinavian countries or, or even Australia. 
Yeah, so countries uh, in, in the affluent world have essentially learned to deal with the gun problem much more effectively. And so they have uh, gun homicide rates that are maybe one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of what we have. Um, and uh, I mentioned that Australia has uh, essentially eliminated their mass shooting problem by a very aggressive gun buyback posture. Uh, New Zealand didn't follow the extreme measures that Australia did until they recently had a, a horrific mass shooting. That's right. 2019, the, the prime minister uh, implemented similar laws to Australia? Yeah. So so essentially, they followed the path of Australia. And um, most European countries have moved in that direction. And of course, countries like Japan and, and England even banned handguns. So, so many countries are much more aggressive than anything that has ever even been talked about in the U.S. Um, but there we're talking about just less guns, less access to guns. Yeah, and and essentially, I think um, uh, there are different types of regimes that you can have. So Switzerland does have a lot of guns, but it is very aggressively regulated. So you're not allowed to carry guns, uh, you know, outside the home at will in the way that many people feel the Second Amendment. Switzerland sometimes brought up by, by gun rights activists saying, not only uh, does Switzerland have this low homicide rate, but most men or men who had served in the military all have uh, assault weapons. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very interesting situation that they have. So they, they do have the well-regulated militia. And so what they tell people is when you get to a certain age in, uh, in Switzerland, you have to have military training, you're given an assault weapon, and then you're given a, car, a, a box that's sealed with bullets in it, and you're forbidden by law to open that up unless a national emergency is declared. And every year you have to show that you didn't open up your bullets. And if you if you did... So you may have a gun, but you, you really can't use it. Yeah. And, and, and if you do use it, everyone will know because your, your, your magazine will you're be... You're out of bullets. Yeah, ex- exactly. Used up. So it, it's very tightly regulated. Uh, and, and what they show is... Uh, in in a stable, affluent country like Switzerland, you can regulate guns, uh, even with assault weapons, and keep things under control much better than we do in the United States, where it's sort of a free for all, and people can walk in and buy AR-15s and hundred round magazines uh, in most p- parts of the United States right now. Although maybe no longer in Walmart. <laughs> That's right. Interestingly, there's been a, a pushback in, uh, you know, a number of prominent businesses being alarmed at what's happening, and they're trying to get out of the business of encouraging mass shootings. Which is interesting, and, and you, you don't, I wouldn't think of a company like Walmart being on the cutting edge of, uh, of any new uh, legal trend, but, but they're out there. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting that a very conservative uh, company like Walmart is, is pulling out. 145 companies recently wrote to the Department of Justice saying, you know, steps need to be taken. So, so the business community is uh, stepping up in a way that uh, uh, Mitch McConnell has been unwilling to do. Well, uh, we will stay tuned and uh, we may try and have you come back as the Supreme Court takes a, a closer look. Thank you so much. John Donahue, thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching Talk Sunday.